thank you guys uh, for staying for the last panel today. We're excited to be here. Um, I'm honored to be with such a great panel. Um, and not only that, but to be helping bridge the gender gap within Silicon Valley and beyond. And uh, this is a great conference, and Mary, you've done a great, a fantastic job. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on myself, I'm a recovering attorney and <laughs> trying. I'm, some of you may know the feeling out there. And uh, I realized I love being with starting startups and working with um, early stage companies on the other side of the table. And so that's, I love the strategy and the operation side of things. So I started a, um, an innovation center called Nest GSV or GSV Labs. And that's where I was really able to uh, not only become an entrepreneur myself, but help other entrepreneurs and build a community around them. And so um, part of that community uh, is the panel here, uh, the, the glue that holds it together, investors. Uh, we have Andy Tang from um, Draper and uh, Rashmi from Microsoft Ventures and Amit from Samsung Next Ventures. And um, I'd like to kind of ask you now to give a little more background on yourselves and tell the audience why you became an investor. We can start with Amit. Okay. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Um, first of all, before starting, I wanted uh, to say thank you to all of you for being here, uh, taking the time, and uh, to all the folks behind, the organi behind organizing this conference, uh, the MKF team, uh, and to my fellow co-panelists. Um, I am part of Samsung Next Ventures. Uh, it is one of three major funds that Samsung has. Uh, mine is the Early Stage Software and Services Fund. It's a $150 million fund, uh, headquartered here in Silicon Valley, but with presence in other parts of the world also, New York, Korea, Berlin, and Tel Aviv, uh, investing globally in early stage, which we define as seed A and B, but the sweet spot really being Series A. Um, I lead digital health for the fund, uh, but we also do artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, machine learning, big data, cloud, basically looking into deep tech, cutting edge technologies. Um, how I got started, um, this is my second stint as a VC. My first stint was after business school. I was part of Norvis Ventures. Uh, it really gave me a taste for what venture capital is. I went on to do my own startup, and then I came back into the venture world. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for being here. I'm Rashmi Gopinath from Microsoft Ventures. So we're a new entrant on the corporate venture side. The team has been around for about a year and a half. We invest off our balance sheet, so it's an evergreen fund. Um, the areas that we focus on are typically on the enterprise software side, so cloud infrastructure, AI, ML, cybersecurity, business SaaS applications, pretty much the entire gamut on the B2B space. This is also my second stint as an investor. I did this uh, prior to Microsoft at Intel Capital. And between my time um, uh, of Intel Capital and Microsoft Ventures, I was on the startup operating side where I ran global business development for Couchbase and for Blue Data. Um, I came into the investment side also after business school. Um, the reason why I'm here is because I am super excited about working with smart, passionate, um, very intelligent entrepreneurs who are determined to make a huge difference in this world, and I would love to be a part of that journey. Um, so thanks again for the opportunity here. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Andy Tang, and um, as Kathleen mentioned earlier, I mainly wear two hats. Uh, so I run a uh, school for first-time entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, um, but my training is really an uh, Venture investor. Uh, I started venture uh, 15 years ago um, out of corporate ventures, uh, and I've been with uh, Tim Draper on the Draper Fund about uh, 12 years now. Uh, we're currently investing from our fifth fund. Uh, it's a $200 million global early stage fund, and we also have sister funds around the world. You, you probably have heard of. Um, Draper Japan, Draper Korea, and there are 12 of these local early stage funds that serve entrepreneurs, especially early stage entrepreneurs uh, worldwide. 
Uh, essentially, our sweet spot is about a million dollar investment to start. So if you're interested in receiving um, uh, seed funding, million dollar range, or if you are just starting out and wanting to learn how to start a business, um, I could feel both of those requests. Thank you. And Andy, you seem, you, so you talk to entrepreneurs on many levels from education to asking for investments. And what I've um, seen lately is that uh, entrepreneurs are having more and more difficult of a time to raise money pre-revenue, before they have a revenue traction or before they have their product. Would you agree with that? And what do you tell your students um, on how to handle that situation? Yeah, so that's actually a good question. I mean, <laughs> the uh, title of the panel is Boosting Startup Valuation. And I, I confess, when M MKF uh, kindly invited me to speak, I was like, sure, I'll do anything for, um, you know, a good cause of promoting women in STEM. And I didn't realize what the title of this panel until a couple of days ago. Then I realized I actually don't qualify to speak about this. Uh, at least I don't know how to boost startup valuation legally. I know how to boost startup value. <laughs> uh, and I think the key is to figure out how to create value and valuation will come. Uh, so I'm joking a little bit. I'm sure that's what it means. Uh, I, I think it's, um, it has become sort of a little bit choppy in terms of early stage financing. Um, I remember when I started 15 years ago, it was actually even harder to raise money because there's no accelerator, right? There's no angel list, right? There's no institutional seed funds like us. So arguably, this compared to 15 or 17 years ago when I started, it's easier. But maybe the year 2017, it's difficult compared to the year 2015. And Amit, um, you've, uh, and Samsung invests in approximately 20 companies a year, is that right? Yeah, that's about right, 15 to 20. 15 to 20. And it's from early stage to B, so you invest in some of the companies that are pre-revenue. Correct. I just want to clarify, yes. Samsung is a very large entity. We have multiple funds. Samsung, Samsung Next. Samsung Next, yeah. okay. My apologies. And um, so what, what do you look for and what type of metrics um, do you look for and, and um, ask entrepreneurs to present when you're looking at an um, investment that's pre-revenue? Right. So uh, there's no guidebook saying this is what seed means, this is what Series A means, this is what Series B means. However, I think anybody who asks entrepreneur or VC will tell you that, look, in general, seed is to prove your prototype, A is to prove your product market fit, and B is to prove your business model. Can you bleed in between these phases? Yes. Can you justify some things over others? Yes, on a case-by-case -case basis. But given the different stages, different things will matter. Uh, I think team always, first and foremost, um, I, I like to think that an A team with a B idea will figure out that the idea is B and will pivot to an A idea. But a B team with an A idea will always be limited by its own skills in order to execute on that idea. Um, so first and foremost, always looking at the team. Now, at a seed stage, the team perhaps matters, not perhaps, definitely matters disproportionately more because you have very few other proof points. You're looking at what's the experience that these founders have had. Do they have credibility? Do they have hunger? Or are they able to build the right set of team around them? Um, you have to believe that this group of people that have come together to execute on this idea is the best possible group of people that could execute it. Uh, at a series A, now you're already starting to look into, okay, are there users? Is there traction? Um, MAUs and DAUs come into play. Uh, some companies will have revenues and you could look into it, but primarily what you're looking is, are they getting some product market fit? Uh, if it's a B2B or a B2C company, are you getting contracts? Or if you're not getting contracts, do you have a pipeline? Are, these, are you able to navigate through this pipeline so you're not stuck in what I call pilot hell of nine to 18 months of, in order to get a contract? And a Series B level, at that point, you're already looking at, okay, so what's your CAC, customer acquisition cost? What's your LTV? What's your churn? Um, if those things apply to you, if they don't apply to you, then what are the things that do apply according to your business model? Um, 
may, maybe the, the thing that applies the most is MRR, which is monthly recurring revenue. Um, there's, once again, no set formula, but as investors at least, we see over and over different companies and we see patterns. So we're able to discriminate and obviously as an entrepreneur, you will have a lot of ideas. So it ends up being a conversation. And to follow up on that, um, what's the top reason for not investing? Um, well, aside from the things such as this being illegal or fraudulent, <laughs> uh, that's a no-no. That's a good one. Uh, but I think what you mean is, if why would you not invest in an idea that's legitimate with legitimate people? Um, I think there's two classes of ideas. Uh, one is um, you're building an idea that's in, McKinsey has this term, red ocean. Uh, it's an extremely competitive space. And if you don't have enough proof points that you can actually over-execute over the other teams or find some kind of niche in that particular space, um, then it's very hard to justify why to make an investment when there's 10 other companies doing something the same as you. On the flip side, the other category is there's not that many companies doing it. Um, you're one of the few, if not perhaps the only one, that has the exact take on it. So what I call you have some kind of differentiation, either a tech differentiation or a business differentiation. And in that case, it's really why hasn't anybody else done it? Or why wouldn't somebody else do it? Why couldn't there be a fast follower? And as investors in general, if you can get comfort around those questions, great. But if not, oftentimes you may find that, yes, I'm building a great idea, but there isn't enough interest from an investor. And um, Rashmi, I, I love the fact that you not only have the experience as an investor, but you've also worked with early stage companies in business development and operations and at a very young stage. And I was just wondering, how has this helped you as an investor? And the, how does this help you when you're working with the entrepreneurs? So one of the things that I had noticed during my first stint as an investor, I had worked in the past in large corporations like Oracle and GE, was you, you often come up with the best advice and strategy based on your assumptions and your learnings and observations. But it's always different when it comes from experience. And I'm sure, Amit, have you having done that, would also agree to it, is when you come back as a founder or an entrepreneur or somebody that has been associated with operating a startup, be it early stage or late stage, having the battle scars, having the, the trap holes that you need to avoid, having the, the information and the experience of having done that is always different. And so now when I look at companies, both from an investment evaluation phase or helping them once they've become portfolio companies, I'm able to offer up advice that comes from experience of having done it before. When I was at the early stage startup, um, that was the first startup experience that I had, um, understanding what matters more around, again, boosting up startup valuation in that early phase. How do you get those early marquee customers to try out your product and be your spokespeople and your champions when you're out fundraising versus at a late stage startup, what you're really focusing on is growing and scaling companies and building up, when I ran business development, so building up channels and resellers and OEM relationships that can help increase your sales by 3x or 4x even over what your direct sales can achieve. So it's very different perspectives that you have at different stages of the company growing phases. And what matters more at the early stage may not matter as much when you're in that growth phase. And so identifying what you need to focus on today, because as an early stage startup, it's very easy to go chasing after the next golden object and the next shiny object. And as a small team, you need to be very focused on what you are trying to do and making sure that you are the very best at doing that either through your own team or by assembling advisors or assembling um, subject matter experts that can help you get there. And so being focused at that early stage, continuing to excel and showing value at what you're doing, and then at the growth stage, focusing on growing and scaling your revenues and getting those financial metrics in place that help you grow even more is important. So those perspectives, I would say, have definitely been greatly enhanced having done that on the entrepreneurship side. And it seems like you and your team actually do um, take a very um, 
I, I, you really help the entrepreneurs in that sense and, and more so than just investing, you're part of the team. And can you explain that a little more? And, Absolutely. And is it only the companies, the portfolio companies that you invest in or do you also help uh, potential companies that um, you have interest in? So obviously we all have limited bandwidths and as much as I would like to help everybody, um, we only have limited hours in the day. So I would love to add more value to my own portfolio companies first, but of course the intent is to try and help everyone. But for our portfolio companies, we want to be true partners for them in their phases of growth. And so Microsoft Ventures has a portfolio operations team that focuses on business development and marketing and co-selling for our portfolio companies within um, all the resources that we can leverage through Microsoft. So for example, this team, which is entirely based in Seattle, uh, works side by side with our portfolio companies to make sure that they get connected to the Microsoft product teams, they get connected to our sales teams, to our co-marketing teams, where we're actually bringing them customers, we're getting them into new markets that they want to get into, making warm introductions for them and demonstrating value for them every single day. So we like to see ourselves as equal partners for our, for our portfolio companies, not just through our funding dollars or investments, but also in their growth phases. So that's a, a unique differentiator that um, I'm sure a lot of corporates do offer. Uh, but with Microsoft Ventures, we've got a number of our portfolio companies that can attest to the value that they see through that. And Andy, you're, you're shaking your head over there as well. And, and what type of resources do you offer your portfolio companies as well? Um, and do you emphasize the education side for the entrepreneurs? Yeah, so I... So I remember when I first started my career, um, I used to th have this philosophy of helping my portfolio companies uh, one purchase order at a time. Then I realized it's actually not that scalable because then you know you run out of you know hours in a day to help them make sales calls. Then what I realized the most important thing was to help them recruit. So I think um, in a startup, especially in early stage, uh, specifically for this panel, how do we boost the value of a startup at the early stage? Um, you know, we really start with a team. So if you could somehow increase the quality of a team, especially at the stage we fund, oftentimes is two to three people, two to five people with a piece of paper. If we could help them find a rock star engineer or a you know, um, really good salesperson, BD person, that actually drastically improved the value of the asset. Right? So we do spend a lot of time both um, sort of scoping out our network, um, and that runs pretty deep from the education side all the way to venture and we even have a affiliated um, growth fund. Um, so we have quite a sort of deep reach in terms of helping people recruit, and that's one. Um, two, I think it's really um, kind of getting our portfolio's mindset correctly, um, because oftentimes uh, first or second time or um, inexperienced entrepreneur will get, really get hung up on valuation, um, which we try to get them to go back to sort of the value-based thinking. And that is, um, if you get a couple offers, um, it's actually more important that you go with the um, investors that you feel the most comfortable with. Um, there is a talk that I give at uh, Draper U, it's called um, Fundraising and Marriage. So I'm coming up to my uh, 10th anniversary next year, so I'm very excited about that. So I often sort of reflect uh, upon this choice that we all make in getting married and, and then the investment decisions we make on, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, for the most part, people don't marry for money. For the most part, right? And I didn't. <laughs> you marry for love. That, that's a whole so, other panel. Right, that's a different <laughs> next one. Uh, so when it comes to fundraising, I think you should sort of think in, to, in those terms, right? If you find an investor you like, oftentimes you have a complaint, well, it's a lower valuation. Um, what does it mean? Lower valuation, okay, so a little bit more dilution. All right, so what does it mean? It basically means if you perform as a team, uh, you'll just go back to your board a couple rounds later and say, I need more options. So that is taken care of. Now, on the flip side, I will actually caution you. If you accidentally got a valuation that's too high, what happens? And if you guys have been around sort of 
a few venture cycles, it doesn't end well, right? It doesn't end well because for the most part, uh, VCs are kind of nice guys and or gals don't like to do down rounds and restructures. We just don't want to piss off the other co-investors that we're going to see again. So no one wants to be the bad person and say, your baby's ugly. Uh, so you actually get stuck. You can't fundraise. And a good idea actually may die on the vine. So that's one of the things we actually strive really hard in this um, school and the boot camp is to get people's mindset correctly for a sort of long journey to success. And, and I do agree, VCs are nice people, so it's, it's good to keep in mind and, uh, when you're presenting in front of a, a, a potential investor. Um, and now, all, everybody here invests in uh, not only Silicon Valley companies, uh, a lot of investors, a lot of VC groups will only invest in companies that are in their backyard, but uh, this panel is, uh, has a lot of experience in global um, investments. And are there any differences that you look at when you're looking at a global investment? And have you, or have you seen any different trends in um, types of companies coming out or types or how they value their companies at pre-revenue stage for global companies? And when I say global, I'm sorry, I mean international coming from outside of Silicon Valley. Um, I'll, I'll start with this because I have somehow managed to have most of my portfolio outside of Silicon Valley. Uh, is Florida considered a separate country? Most certainly. Okay. Um, so I, I do have a portfolio company in Florida. I have one in New York. I have one split between Boston and Singapore. I have one in the UK and split between Italy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, bottom line is uh, there's a, a bunch of factors that you look for any, in any company. Um, is this company going to be able to recruit the right set of people? Um, and that's certainly a question here in Silicon Valley also. It's just that here, oftentimes, it's not lack of talent. It's more you're competing with so many other folks for that talent. Um, when I was doing my own startup, I remember very well, I would find an engineer, and then Google would pay 2x of that engineer. How do I, how do I compete with that? Um, Sometimes you don't, and maybe that's not the right engineer. But in Silicon Valley, by and large, it's a competition for talent. In other geographies, it may be access to the talent. You, when I'm looking at an ecosystem that's less developed, perhaps, I'm not saying that there aren't good people there. There's fantastic people, but there's a lower number for them. Um, and they may have different expectations also for what they're trying to get from being in the startup. They may be seeking more stability rather than equity. Um, so there, I have a mental model that's constantly being readjusted for it. Um, at this point, I think it's safe to say that ecosystems like New York and Boston um, are, are fairly developed. They are not perhaps as big as Silicon Valley, but they're fairly mature. But when you start looking into ecosystems like uh, I'm, I've been leading over India thesis, and India is an emerging ecosystem. Um, I do look at that question is, look, will this company be even able to hire the right set of people? Uh, that's one. The other one is um, being able to help them with, um, with BD or with local market access, with the day-to-day -day stuff that they need, the company needs to succeed. Um, if it's a company that's targeted towards a global market, like many Israeli companies are, uh, and we are very strong in Israel. We have made a ton of investments in Israel, so I'm disproportionately exposed to that story. Um, a lot of Israeli companies actually target the U.S. In that case we can be meaningfully helpful because we understand the states, but what if it's a company that's focused on the local market itself, a company that's based in China, focused on China? If I don't understand China well enough, can I be meaningfully helpful to them? So in that case, it's, I'm looking for help from co-investors. I, I look for are there folks here on the cap table that are actively going to help in, fill in the gaps that I can provide uh, that will help me validate the company's proposition uh, that will help recruit also. And if I can't get comfort around that, then I'll actually tell the company, look, I, I would love to help, but I don't have the skill set to be able to help you. So those two would be the biggest ones. And I, I was looking at the time. We only have five more minutes here. And I wanted to uh, kind of tie it back into the rest of the conference. 
And uh, we've been talking a lot today that um, uh, women do have uh, fewer opportunities in, to get into the tech world and how um, not only to enter the tech world but to move up within the tech world. And today we're saying to um, one of the key parts of valuing, getting a higher value in, uh, for a startup that's pre-revenue is team. So do you have advice for female entrepreneurs or even female investors um, that would like to get into the investing world with, um, to help them um, be able to argue their valuation and increase and boost their valuation um, with these, when they have fewer opportunities to build their resumes and uh, for the um, team aspect of valuation? can go first. So this comes more from personal experience. Um, as, as women, we like to check off all the boxes before we move forward. And so if you're an entrepreneur, you want to make sure that your story is perfect to the T. If you're applying for a job, you want to make sure that you check off all the requirements before you apply to it and you question yourself, am I good enough for that? Um, I would say be confident in, in your endeavor, whatever you're trying to do. Uh, be seen as a subject matter expert, be confident. When you go and present to investors, don't let your own questions stand in your way and affect your pitch. Um, as, as investors, I'm sure this is applicable to most investors, we really have no filter on the gender of the entrepreneur that's coming in. It's really about, is this person capable to take this company to that next level of growth? Can we make financial returns on this investment? If you can prove that to an investor, you have a great shot at fundraising. Um, if you can prove that to a fund that's looking to bring on um, a smart investor on board, you have a great position to get that job to. So one question that I would say is be thorough in whatever space that you're in, whatever company you're trying to build. If there's a space that you're looking to invest in, be thorough about that space. And then just be confident about yourselves and know that you are going to succeed. So. Think big and, and achieve big. That would be my advice. Do we have time? Yes. Um, I, I, I will confess that I don't understand all the issues. I, I feel like it's, it's easy to give advice based on my perspectives and what I've experienced, um, but it wouldn't capture all of reality. Uh, so instead of that, I'll actually give an example. Um, I invested in Melissa Manis, who uh, founded, co-founded Cohero Health out of New York, and that's a company that does respiratory management. It helps people with asthma and COPD, which is 50 million Americans, um, be able to manage their condition better. Uh, I invested in Melissa because I saw in her somebody who truly understood the problem. She has multiple degrees in this. She has spent a lifetime working in this field. She started a company you know, it takes a lot of guts to start a company. I think everybody in this room will realize to leave the comfort of academia to take this leap because she's thought, okay, I have something to offer here to the world. I can create a solution that makes people's life better. Um, I invested in her because of that. I didn't invest in her because she was a woman or because of her age or because of anything else or her race. I invested in her because I saw somebody who was passionate, motivated, and capable. So I guess I'm echoing uh, my co-panelist here. It's when you're doing a startup, it's hard enough. Um, don't be dissuaded by all the other factors. Show the value you provide. If, if you're providing some value, you will get the valuation. Thank you. And Andy, do you have? Yeah, I, I can just add and, and quickly um, kind of sum up my thoughts. Um, I think it's, again, so valuation aside, I think the key is to get funded. <laughs> I think the key is to get funded by the right investor who believes in you, whether that's a man, a woman, uh, regardless of age. And that's all sort of how we have been proceeding in the last, you know, um, 20 years. And if we look at our um, Draper U graduates, 800 of them, there were probably 10, Forbes, 30 under 30, and there were eight women. And we only have 30% women. We're trying to get to 50 so there is a, actually a disproportionate number of alumni do well outperforming the men, but we don't try to sort of gender engineer. We take the best people. We believe taking the best people, they'll do the best things for us. 
Thank you, and uh, happy anniversary coming up. <laughs> uh, so we're out of time, um, but if we have one or two questions, we can, uh, and I can't not see hands. We may not so. be able to see them, but we can hear them. Yes. No questions? I think I see somebody moving. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'll ask a question. So what are the uh, tips for you to advise startup in terms of adding value to what they do so they'll be, they'll, they'll be able to boost up the valuations? Um, I think this was aimed to me uh, or maybe to all of us, but um, value in my view comes in many different shapes and forms. It's not a single definition. Um, do you have expertise in a particular subject matter? Uh, are you perhaps a world authority, or if you're not a world authority, have you had some insight that nobody else had? Or if other people have had, you have a way of executing upon that insight that will be better or different. Um, it could be based on some understanding of technology you have, or it could be based on you having access to business relationships. Uh, and let's not minimize that. It's if you, let's say, I lead digital health, so I think a lot about these things. If you have access to payers and providers, basically hospitals and insurance systems, if you can actually get through to them, it's huge. It's enor normally can take 18 months. If you're able to do that in three months, you have just saved yourself 15. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for what is something that you bring that's critical to the table that, that, that will be essential for your company to succeed. Anybody else? Okay, I think uh, yeah, I think uh, we're the last panel today, and uh, thank you very much. And I is someone else, is someone coming today? Oh, I see. I can't see anything. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and um, have a great day.